We'll explain the accounting for liability at amortized cost. So let's do A first of all. We have a liability at amortized cost. Three lines as raised finance on the first day of the year by the issue of a bond that will only last for two years. It's a 2% bond. It's $10,000, so there will be 200 being paid every year, and it's been issued at a discount of 5%. It is redeemable at a premium, and the bond has an effective rate of 10%. So, I would want to find one sentence, maybe two sentences, which explains the accounting treatment for the liability. If we have a liability at amortized cost, we are never going to trade it. We're never going to sell it. All that's going to happen is that we pay it off. So we're not interested in the changes in the value. We will simply charge the effective rate Appear. So liability at amortized cost, yeah, um, so um, initial recognition, initial recognition is at fair value, less issue costs, with the P&L charged, Here now charged with a finance cost at the effective rate. The year end liability is not revalued. The year end liability is not revalued. This should be quite straightforward. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. This should be quite straightforward. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. How much is the opening balance? Effective rate of interest? 10%. So what's the finance cost? 950. How much cash am I paying? 10, it's only a two year story. I feel, therefore, I'll take it forward to the second year. You're charging the effective rate of 10%. Because your liability is bigger, your finance cost is bigger. Yeah? The bigger the liability, the bigger the finance cost. You are paying interest of 200. But what also happens is that you are redeeming the debenture at the end of the second year. So you pay back your 10,000. Not only do you pay back your 10,000, but you pay back a premium. And how much was that premium? 075. So this means that everything effectively balances. This means everything effectively works out. Because your 10,250 plus your 1,025 gives you 11,275, and that figure there is nil. What you have done is you've taken the, uh, what you've done is you've got your total finance cost of 1975 
and your total finance cost of 1975 is made up of three parts. This total finance cost is made up of the interest that you've paid, and the interest that you've paid is 400. The premium that you've paid, and the premium that you've paid is 1,075, and the discount that you gave on the issue, which was 500. So that also makes 1,975. So your total finance cost can be thought of in different ways. Is that all right? Yeah, your finance cost? So the cost of borrowing money is not just the interest that you pay, but the premium that you pay is also a finance cost. The discount that you give, because you end up paying back the 10, so you've paid back a further 500, that's also a cost of borrowing money. So the effective rate of interest is what we must charge in the here now. Right. In about half an hour's time, back up, back, stop, stop. I have borrowed money. So because I have borrowed money, this is my finance cost. In half an hour's time, I'll be lending money. Now, if I lend money, this will be my asset. And if I lend money, the return on my investment, my effective rate, that will be my income. So I will say, and then move on quite quickly, that we will have some financial assets at amortized cost. And a financial asset that is an amortized cost is one that you never want to sell. Yeah, we're not trading this liability, we're just running it down and it runs down to nil. If we're the lender, we will have 10% interest that we're earning, and this will be our asset at the year end. And we'll be receiving the 200, but the accounting will be the same. We're looking at the question of three lines. Yes. The effective rate of interest is 10% in the question. So the borrower has a finance cost of 10% that we charge as an expense in the PL. The lender has lent the money and is charging 10% and will effectively receive a 10% return on their loan, which will be an asset. Because a financial instrument creates a financial asset in one entity and a liability or equity instrument in another. So we always start by thinking about borrowing money. But equally, we can think about lending money. And if we're lending money, then this is an asset. But we'll look at that again. But I just want to plant the seed now. Fair value option. Fair value option. So an option is where you have a choice. So it is possible that you can choose to have a liability at fair value through PL by making a fair value option. Now, in order to make a fair value option, there are a number of conditions that have to be met. First of all, it's an irrevocable election. Secondly, you have to have a reliable measure of the fair value. And thirdly, you're doing it because you're wanting to avoid an accounting mismatch. Hmm. What do I mean by that? I have gone out and borrowed some money 
And the reason I have borrowed some money is because I'm buying some assets. And these assets are being measured at fair value. And I'm monitoring the two together. So if I am using the loan to buy an asset, which I have at fair value through P&L, it would avoid an accounting mismatch if I also had the liability at fair value through P&L. Because if the, value, if the fair value went up, I'd have a gain. And if the fair value of the liability went up, I'd have a loss. And I want to net that off. So the idea is that it would be an accounting mismatch if we had the liability at cost, but the asset at fair value. So if we are specifically using the loan to buy an asset which itself is going to be measured at fair value, then you would be able to use the fair value option. The fair value option has to be exercised when you take the loan out, and it's an irrevocable designation. It also, uh, you also have to have a way of reliably measuring the fair value, because if you can't reliably measure it, then you can't exercise it. So fair value option, this is only allowed if it avoids an accounting mismatch, i.e. The loan has been taken out to finance assets that are measured at fair value through profit and loss. So, this is only allowed if it avoids an accounting mismatch. Secondly, there is a reliable measure. Thirdly, we must note that it's irrevocable. Yeah, it's irrevocable and it has to be done at inception. It has to be done on initial recognition. Show and explain the liability, the accounting for liability of fair value through P&L in the first year. If a bond had been issued to finance an investment property, which is accounted for at fair value, then the fair value option could have been exercised in order to avoid an accounting mismatch. And in these circumstances, the liability is accounted for at fair value through P&L. Because of the fall in interest rates, the fair value of the liability one year after the issue is 10000 so if you have a fall in interest rates, that's the discounting becoming smaller, so the value of the liability becomes bigger. So at the year end, we have a fair value of the liability, and the fair value of the liability maybe is given to us at 10,600. If the bond is quoted on a recognized stock exchange, then that would be a level one fair value. So some bonds are traded, so you could observe directly the fair value. Or, conceivably, you could calculate it, being the present value of the future cash flow. So the fair value of the liability is 10,600, because it says so in the question. What's the carrying value? At the end of the first year, what's the carrying value of the liability? 10,250. So the carrying value per above, the carrying value per above is 10,250. So we have here a difference of 350. Is that 350 a gain or a loss? Has your liability got bigger or smaller? Bigger. Your liability's got bigger, so is that a gain or a loss? Loss. loss. So this is a loss. It's a fair value through P&L, 
So you would take the changes in the fair value due to the credit risk to OCI, but this is down to a change in interest rates, so the loss would go to PL. Change in fair value does not relate to credit risk. Change in fair value does not relate to credit risk. Therefore, the announcement. For the avoidance of any doubt, let me show you the extracts from the accounts that you would then be experiencing for the avoidance of any doubt. So the change in the fair value does not relate to change in the credit risk, and therefore that is why this loss will be in the p &L. So what would you have in the p &L? In your p &L, you would have your finance cost. And in the P&L, your finance cost would be 950. In your P&L, you would have then the um, loss on the fair value of the liability, and the loss on the fair value of the liability would be 350. doesn't quite show us what the gain on the fair value of the asset would be, but presumably there would be a gain. And then in your statement of financial position, you would have a liability, which is fair value through profit and loss, and your liability would be 10,600. 